Mike Wedge for that presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, our panel's back at the front, so I wanted to um, I wanted to ask the panel. We're talking a lot about relationships and relationality between Indigenous people and state policy and other things, and even museums. I mean, we've heard from. United Nations and what's happening on international all the way down to even within repatriation within museums and that it's about relationships and relation building. So my question is, and moving into uh, sort of I guess the crux of a lot of what we're talking about here at this conference, is what is an anthropologist's role in this idea of building relationships or being part of the re relationships and how as anthropologists do they rethink that positionality and build, again, those relationships. So maybe I'll pass it to Michael to start. I started the last time. Let's okay, else. fair enough. Okay. Bon, quel est le rôle de, de l'anthropologue euh, dans, la, dans la construction euh, de, de, de ces relations euh, je pense qu'avec euh, la présentation de euh, Margaret, on a eu un très bel exemple de, de méthodologie, mais qui c'est plus qu'une méthodologie, en fait c'est une démarche. Hein. On a tendance à, à penser les méthodologies comme étant seulement techniques, mais en fait les méthodologies que les anthropologues euh, peuvent utiliser sont des manières de créer des relations. Et si on voit les méthodologies non seulement comme étant des, des techniques, des procédures pour avoir accès à de l'information, mais bien comme une démarche qui relève d'une posture. Hein? C'est une posture épistémologique euh, que la méthodologie. Euh, je pense qu'on est dans quelque chose qui est... Euh, qui était peut-être là auparavant, sur le plan individuel, mais qu'on commence à institutionnaliser. Alors, les démarches euh, utilisées par les anthropologues à l'égard d'une, on pourrait dire, une reconstitution, restorative euh, euh, methodologies, une reconstitution, une restauration, mais comme je le disais tout à l'heure, aussi une régénération. Euh, et régénération va peut-être encore plus loin dans la construction de ces relations. C'est vraiment euh, la, la possibilité de remettre au jour des systèmes de sens, des systèmes de savoir, mais aussi, avec un exemple comme les Wampum, des systèmes de gouvernance. Et je crois que c'est notre responsabilité de travailler dans ce sens dans ces directions, pour renouveler les questionnements. Euh, parce que lorsqu'on travaille à l'échelle de la relation, on n'est plus placé euh, de la même manière devant les phénomènes. On n'oppose plus le local avec le global. On n'oppose pas l'individuel avec le collectif. Euh, on ne polarise pas nos questionnements. Euh, et je crois que ces oppositions qu'on a oui, perdu, oui, bon, ok, ces oppositions que l'on crée entre le local et le global, entre l'individuel et le collectif, finalement nous empêchent de voir la manière dont les relations se construisent dans ces deux, deux univers ou dans ces deux espaces à la fois. Alors. Quand on travaille à l'échelle locale, on construit aussi le global. Et quand on travaille à l'échelle globale, on devrait aussi construire, et ça se fait régulièrement, le local. Il, je pense que c'est là l'originalité euh, de, de la démarche anthropologique, c'est de créer des situations de recomposition de ces relations. Et si on est dans une échelle uniquement hiérarchique, euh, du local au global ou du, du global au local, on perd de vue 
l'essence de cette relation qui traverse tous les états, qui traverse tous les espaces. Je vais être là pour l'instant. Euh... Okay, well, I'm, uh, I'm still thinking this through. Um, so I can, I can really speak from, from my place. I consider myself, uh, I consider anthropology for me to not be so much the study of people or any, I consider it to be a location in a political argument regarding what is the, what is a good way to live in the world. And I consider it in particular an argument that was mounted against an aspect of enlightenment thinking which said there was only one good way to live in the world. And that was the way that was developed in the West. A lot of the problems that we're hearing here, and I'll just say this as an aside, is the reaping the whirlwind of some of those enlightenment theories. Now, I'm not totally against the enlightenment, you know, I'm not saying but there are some things that the Enlightenment got really wrong, of which one that really kills us every day is that there's a concept of a self that can stand completely outside of other selves. It's the, Toder have called it the anti-social self. And it's the hegemonic around which the notion of states are organized and so on. So an awful lot of what's discussed begins with an assumption that there's a state and then there are these little edges, things that don't fit in. Because even Mills, Mills said in the 19th century, he said, you know, the nation and the state need to go together, but they never do. Walker Connor wrote in the 1970s that uh, there are only seven states in the world where this happened and we don't quite know what to do with the rest. Okay, so that's the preface for, so we need to deal with that problem as anthropologists. That should be in somewhere in our minds because we arise from a reaction to this whole thing. And if I would say what our Leviathan is, to which political theorists have reacted, it's ancient society. And how many of you really know ancient society and know the strong reaction that we have as a discipline to argue against the position that Morgan took there? So for myself, I, I, at this point, I, I, my history for those of you who don't know it, I'll just say really quickly, has been, was completely engaged in the kind of work that you I worked with the Denner for a long, long time. And I came to a moment in 19, about 1985 or so on where I said, what's going on with the Denner? I, I, love, I like them and I like working with them and I have good friends, but you know what's really troubling? So this is where I'm talking about relationship. What's really troubling to me is why we are so resistant. What's going on with us to make us so resistant to what was it? They're just simple propositions that could really make things work better. What is it about the way in which we think, the way we act, the forces, the economic forces, and so on? What are these things that are happening? And how do we smash this idea that there's this unitary self? And what these people are saying is all along the same lines. of How do we deal with this problematic? What do we do about it? So that's where I place my relationality. So whatever I do, I'm placing it in trying to work through with other people how it is that we can imagine a polity that does not operate that way. And in that regard, what's so amazing for those of us who are settlers in this country, and I would bet elsewhere too, um, is that indigenous peoples have developed for a very long time a set of traditions around political relationships that does not rely on that form of thinking. We don't know it very well, and I've taken a lot from it, and I've tried to translate it and, and work with it, but I can tell you that that's 
where I situate my relationality. Moi, j'aimerais rajouter à ce qui a été dit par Michael et, et, et Carole sur la, à partir de la question de la relation, que je pense très fondamentale, que l'anthropologie aujourd'hui est quand même l'objet d'une critique très forte de la part justement des peuples autochtones qui euh, cherchent à se réapproprier euh, non seulement de leur savoir et des euh, sens, comme l'a dit Margaret, on ne travaille pas forcément sur les sens, mais sur euh, la possession ou sur le droit euh, à, à parler à propos d'un objet, euh, ce qui est tout à fait étrange pour nous, puisqu'on pense que nous, scientifiques, on peut parler sur tous les objets euh, à partir du moment où on, où on, où on s'en saisit. Euh, mais euh, que la, la, la question de cette... Euh, pour moi, les, les peuples autochtones, c'est une catégorie politique relationnelle. Ce n'est pas une essence. Et donc, à partir de là, on peut avancer. Mais déjà, pour pouvoir dire cela, il faut pouvoir travailler au plan politique. Avant que je commence cette recherche sur les peuples autochtones, le terme autochtone en France était absolument indicible. Les gens comprennent implicitement, et c'est difficile à traduire en anglais, mais... Si je dis indigène en français, ça peut être accepté. Si je dis autochtone, c'est refusé. Si je dis indigenous en anglais ou indigena, ça marche. Donc on a ces problèmes de sens parce qu'au fond, on reste encore dans des régimes de domination. Donc on doit, avoir, on doit mener une bataille sémantique. On doit expliquer la raison pour laquelle cette bataille sémantique est nécessaire. Et à partir de là, on rentre à l'intérieur de choses beaucoup plus compliquées qui sont la manière dont l'anthropologie se construit comme discipline, s'est construit comme discipline. Et en France en particulier, on travaille sur le reste du monde. On travaille très peu sur nos, je mets des cotations, des, des, nos peuples autochtones. On a, on a beaucoup de difficultés même, alors qu'on travaille sur les Kalinias, sur les, euh, euh, les Wayana. On peut les nommer, mais on ne va pas les nommer comme peuples autochtones à cause de cette position politique. Donc là, c'est déjà un enjeu. Euh, et donc... Cet enjeu-là, lequel est-il Il est aussi de reconnaître aujourd'hui que les peuples autochtones ne sont pas dans des cabinets de curiosité. Ils ne sont pas simplement dans les musées, même s'il faut travailler sur ce que les objets des musées nous disent et les rapatrier. Ils sont vivants. Ils, sont, ils veulent s'exprimer. Et donc, il faut reconnaître aujourd'hui ces formes d'action, ces formes d'expression. Et ça nous oblige à travailler, nous, anthropologues, d'une autre façon, à travers des logiques d'engagement, des logiques d'approche collaborative qui sont en train de se nouer ailleurs aussi, pas qu'avec les peuples autochtones, heureusement. Et cette co-construction des savoirs dont, dont parlait euh, Carole est tout à fait importante, me semble-t-il, mais ça engage, ces textes, c'est sur des grands défis, la co-construction des savoirs, parce qu'il y a des enjeux de pouvoir euh, et que, quelque part, ça doit se situer au milieu. Est-ce que la vérité et d'un objet à rechercher. Est-ce que cette vérité se situe du côté des autochtones ou du côté de la science est un enjeu de débat et il faut se saisir de, cette, de, cette, de cet enjeu-là. Et à partir de là, euh, on rentre dans ces logiques de partenariat et ces logiques de partenariat, je les vois se développer par exemple, au niveau international, et ma fonction ou mon rôle là, c'est de pouvoir les expliquer, les rendre clairs, montrer ce qui se passe là-bas, euh, parce qu'on a des milliers de personnes qui se, qui se présentent euh, là et qu'il et qu faut comprendre ces dynamiques. Mais en même temps, ces logiques de partenariat, il faut être bien consciente qu'elles transforment les peuples autochtones à partir du moment où ils sont engagés dans les nouvelles formes de gouvernance, dans l'affirmation de leur... Euh, de leur euh, voilà. Donc, ils sont euh, comment dire, à la fois vivants, en train de se transformer. Et c'est cet enjeu-là de la transformation qui, aujourd'hui, prend un sens particulier parce qu'on est, comment dire, euh, confronté à des euh, logiques où on va dire, mais ce ne sont plus des autochtones. Ce sont, ils, ce sont plus, ils, sont, ils sont comme nous maintenant. Et comment est-ce qu'on peut être comme nous et autochtones, c'est-à-dire reconnaître cette variabilité des sens et des savoirs à l'intérieur de nos systèmes de sens plus vastes. Je pense que là, on a des batailles à mener sur euh, un problème important qui est celui de l'authenticité culturelle et euh, de la capacité à pouvoir passer d'un monde à l'autre. Et donc, avec la notion de partenariat, 
j'introduirai la notion de médiation culturelle qui doit fonctionner dans les deux sens. I have a number of thoughts, as you can imagine, on this. And um, one of them is, I, th I tend to think generationally. So I sometimes say, act locally, but think generationally. And it's because much of the work that I do in tracking anthropologists is working with someone else's dead. I started in the academy working with indigenous dead because repatriation was so urgent and so critical, and I was quite disturbed when I was in graduate school to learn that there were more dead bodies in the basement of Mockmer Hall than there were living Indians on campus. So that really is what set me on the path to repatriation. But when I started tracking anthropological ancestors, many of my professors and mentors tried to steer me away from that. Because as I said a little earlier, there was that idea of inherited knowledge somehow being more valid than anything that any indigenous community or individual might have to say. And I'd like to share with you two quick stories in response to this question of where anthropologists need to go. One is that I think the increased emphasis on positionality and relationality and transformation and transculturation is absolutely critical in forcing each of us to identify who we are, where we stand, and who we are obligated to. Because in many cases in the academy, in institutions, in governmental situations, people have obligations that precede human rights, obligations that often act in place of the quote unquote right thing if there is a right thing. So even as I look around this room, I'm saying to myself, where are the people from Kitagan Zibi? Where are the people from Tayandanega? Where are the indigenous communities we are talking about and why are they not here in this room with us? I know there are a scattering of people here, but it's always interesting that we are still anthropologists talking to ourselves in a sense. So we really need to improve that, even those of us who are indigenous and anthropologists. So the story I'd like to share with you is that when I started working on Frank Speck, my colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania, um, curators in every institution and archive that hold Frank Speck's collections and papers all swore to me that there were three things that were absolutely true about this brilliant anthropologist. He had some native ancestry. He was raised by Fidelia Fielding uh, at, at the Mohegan uh, Reservation, and that he started the Department of Anthropology at Penn. None of those are true. He had no indigenous ancestry. He was not raised by the Mohegans, and he did not found the department. So I will tell you that it, it was a little bit interesting for my own positionality to be hired as a target of opportunity by Penn and to arrive to say, by the way, I need to change your narrative about your own origin story. Because in fact, the department was created by the Penn Museum, which was then directed by George Gordon. There was a great split between Gordon and Speck. And as a result of that split, that leads to the second story. Speck was short for research funds in 1913. And 1913 is the year that he did a survey that brought him from Ganawage, Ganesatage, over to um, Tamagami and Tamiskaming, where he first met with Algonquin peoples who were struggling because of the, um, the recent introduction of new leases to literally American millionaires who were hunting and fishing on traditional Algonquin territories, and native communities were starving. And Edward Sapir had left the University of Pennsylvania to come to what was then the Victoria Museum. So in their correspondence, which some of you may have seen, Speck and Sapir were talking about many things. They were talking about how awful George Gordon was. They were talking about whether Gordon would treat Louis Shotridge, a Tlingit Indian hired as a curator, well. They were talking about where they were going to get money to do the research they wanted to do. And they were talking about the relative values of collections. And at the very same moment in time that Speck realized that native communities were starving and he could do something to assert patrilineal ownership of these indigenous hunting territories to say in the headlines of newspapers that native people were not roaming nomads, but they were literal keepers of the game. He put that idea forward, but he needed money for his research. And he happened upon a Frenchman married to a Mohawk woman who had four wampum belts in his possession. 
So Speck bought all four wampum belts. You saw one of them in my presentation. Two went to the Canadian Museum where they rest today. Two went to the Museum of the American Indian. He sold them to George Gordon. One traveled to Washington when MAI became NMAI. And then one was sold out the back door to a private collector who came up with a lot of money. So I tell you that story because many of the knowledges that are encoded and embedded in anthropological publications are the result of very strategic encounters on the ground that we do not understand in the present day. So when the Canadian government asserts that Aboriginal territories are not valid or that their boundaries are not secure, and when they have the uh, decision to somehow cite Frank Speck on that, what they miss is the fact that in 1913, when Native people were starving, the only thing they could do was to sell whatever they owed of value to, to enlist this outsider to promote something the Canadian government would accept, which was patrilineal governance. But to do so, they had to erase, to a certain degree in the political context, matrilineal governance. And so I would argue that many of the problems in Canada and in the US today can be traced not just to processes of colonization, not just to inequities and human rights violations, but two, salvage anthropology, because that is the moment in time that created these categories of savage and other, of civilized and not, of authentic and inauthentic. That if native people are making tourist objects, they are no longer authentically indigenous. If they are mixed race, they are no longer authentic. So all those arguments around authenticity, including Frank Speck's supposed indigenous authenticity, all track back, I believe, to the same source. And I believe that it's possible for us to correct that. I truly do. And it's possible only to correct if we come to terms with who we are right now. And we sort of reopen that conversation. I'll stop. Miigwech, those are great words. Um, so much to say along these topics and these lines, especially around uh, the role of the anthropologist and interesting enough now increasingly the role of the indigenous anthropologist. Um, but one thing, I, 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 a quick quick side about the, um, the wampum, when you showed that one wampum that was different color, uh, it reminds me very much of, uh, I used to do uh, powwow dancing and, and feather dancing fancy and and we always were told when we were putting together our beadwork that we had to put what we call a spirit bead into our beadwork, which was a bead that was of a different color completely, did not make sense there, was because nothing in nature is perfect, and it reminds us of our own self flaws. So it's interesting is that you know you see that in wampum as well, and it's something that I didn't know, so I, I appreciate that knowledge. I've, it's interesting because a. Everybody here on the panel has talked, uh, one point or not, they've said something about values and about that interpersonal values, but also the values of a discipline and the values of indigenous people and the knowledge that, that it carries and it holds. And I think that it's, uh, if we look at some of the traditional knowledges, even around um, seven generations philosophy, which is that in everything we do, we must consider seven generations down the road. And then we talk about the discipline and what we do as today as anthropologists, but also even corporations and what we're doing in partnership development and in, uh, in organizations such as NGOs. That knowledge, if that was part of that knowledge system, if that was part of the belief system in which came, came forward at the beginning of this, we'd be looking and having a very different conversation today. So the knowledge has been, we, we give it lip service, I think, a lot of times, but it certainly hasn't been ingrained or even brought into sort of mainstream um, politics and mainstream organizations and, and whatnot as well. So last comments, and we've got a little bit of time, but uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about that application of maybe traditional knowledge and values and the value of bringing that into the way that we look at the politics, the discipline, and even your own personal work and research? Tough question. <laughs> I 
don't know why it's coming back to me. Um, I think we have to work with indigenous communities. That's the quick answer there. And we have to leave room for multiple perspectives and not just in terms of allowing for a diversity of perspectives, but for allowing for different interpretations of the same histories to exist. So as, as Carol said, we shouldn't be arguing about ownership and um, you know, sort of what, what is a single fact, but we should be arguing about how do we relate around that fact and, and where do we go forward from here. And actually I'd like to share um, one other anecdote that to me speaks to that issue and it may seem it may seem to be a diversion, but I believe it's sort of central. In 1535, when Jacques Cartier came up the St. Lawrence and encountered what we now call St. Lawrence Iroquoian, who were Iroquoian and Algonquian peoples, the native people he was meeting were coming back from war. And they were coming back from war and they were carrying the bodies of their dead enemies. And he records how they took these bodies and they sliced them open along the large muscles and then they laid these bodies in the waters of the St. Lawrence and weighted them down with rocks. And then they went aside and had a feast. And a few days later, they brought these bodies up and they were completely covered with whelk and quahog. And they collected those shells and they made beads and they made belts and they used the belts to make peace with their enemies who were still alive. So there's a certain indigenous knowledge in working with what is, in literally working with the debris and the destruction that is around you to create peace. And I think we need that drive at any moment, even, even when we are grappling with the worst problems. And I'm thinking here of, the for me, a related anecdote is at the Woodland Cultural Center, an exhibit that grappled with the boarding schools by taking the literal doors in their brokenness and their peeling paint from the residential school and covering them with beautiful art. People coming together, native people who were residential school survivors, people from the religious communities, people from the general community coming together to learn to bead and to decorate those broken doors. And there's something wonderful in that bricolage of bringing together what is broken and what is new to create healing. And I think that is something that comes from indigenous knowledge that we all could benefit from. Je vais essayer d'être brève, mais je vois que y a, uh, on a ici une manière de discuter qui est extrêmement passionnante et intéressante, mais qui n'a absolument aucun, aucun correspondant dans un autre monde que j'ai eu l'occasion de connaître. J'ai passé quatre ans en Amazonie péruvienne. J'ai appris euh, à vivre avec les Maïhuna. Euh, j'ai appris leur système de valeurs, leur, euh, leur manière de penser, leur langue, leur cosmovision. Euh, je l'ai décrite, je l'ai écrite. Et je suis retournée chez eux après avoir soutenu ma thèse, genre 25 ans après, et j'ai vu tout le changement qui était passé entre temps euh, chez eux et qui euh, a fait qu'ils sont dans un processus de changement social euh, extraordinairement problématique. Leur terre a été envahie, leur, euh, for, leurs ressources ont été épuisées par euh, les exploitations forestières, par le pétrole, par tout cela. Euh, ils sont en train de lutter, ils sont peut-être dans cette situation où, euh, que décrivait Margaret juste avant. Ils n'ont rien à vendre. Euh, et donc, du coup, euh, la, la question de leur, de leur système de valeurs, de leur système de pensée, de leur, euh, de leur savoir traditionnel euh, emprunte une toute autre route que celle qui euh, est discutée aujourd'hui. Ils n'ont d'ailleurs pas d'objet dans les musées. Et, et, et quelque part, il y a beaucoup de peuples autochtones qui sont dans cette situation-là. Euh, de ne pas euh, être en possession et en capacité de pouvoir articuler avec l'université, avec euh, le reste du monde. Et 
donc là, je vois ce qui se passe à ce niveau-là, en Amazonie. Et puis, je vois au niveau international qu'il y a un énorme déploiement d'opérations autour de, justement, la protection des expressions culturelles, le rapatriement des objets, des restes humains, des objets qui sont dans les musées, la question de la traduction des sens. Et là, on s'aperçoit que dans ces espaces-là, internationaux, principalement piloté à la fois par l'UNESCO, mais aussi par l'Organisation mondiale de la propriété intellectuelle. Les savoirs autochtones sont totalement requalifiés. Ils rentrent dans des bases de données. Ils sont l'objet de, de, de mesures euh, et, et pas d'interprétation dans le sens de cet esprit qui nous anime. Et je pense que ça, c'est un point qu'il faut avoir à l'esprit, que c'est extraordinairement différent, à, enfin difficile à, 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 à porter à l'esprit. Et donc, euh, euh, on, on, en anthropologie, aujourd'hui, on va commencer à réfléchir sur cette notion de régime de valeur et on va pouvoir peut-être effectivement poser la question de ces différents régimes de valeur au niveau local. Et je ne me mets pas de hiérarchie hein, entre le local, le régional et, et l'international ou le global. Mais je pense qu'effectivement, euh, dans le relationnel que l'on peut avoir en face à face, dans la compréhension qu'on peut avoir d'une certaine société, on peut avoir effectivement une certaine compréhension. Mais tout ceci vient et rentre dans un processus de transformation important au niveau international et rentre dans un régime de circulation des sens et donc de circulation de la valeur sur laquelle il faut se pencher parce que euh, le, comment est-ce qu'on mesure la valeur Est-ce qu'on mesure la valeur en termes de bien-être ou est-ce qu'on la mesure en termes économiques Et ça, c'est un point extraordinairement important sur lequel il faut peut-être développer des recherches. Je vais euh, simplement raconter une situation euh, qui, pour moi, est extrêmement riche euh, d'enseignements et qui est une manière, je dirais, contemporaine d'exprimer de, des savoirs autochtones. Je ne parle pas nécessairement de savoir traditionnel, mais de savoir autochtone ou « indigenous uh, knowledge ». Euh, dans le contexte du dossier de cette tragédie des femmes autochtones euh, disparues ou assassinées au Canada, et il y en a ailleurs bien sûr, mais au Canada, euh, un groupe de femmes euh, autochtones a développé une exposition euh, faite de, on appelle « Mocassin Trail », euh, faite d'empeigne de mocassin. Hein. L'empeigne, c'est la partie qui est ici, sur le, le pied, qui est brodée avec des perles ou du fil de soie ou du crin d'orignal. Et les femmes qui ont participé à, à, la, à cette performance, hein, parce qu'il s'agit vraiment d'une performance, ont, avec leur savoir, euh, décoré ces empeignes. Elles n'ont pas créer le mocassin, uniquement l'empeigne, parce que l'empeigne euh, signifie à la fois les savoirs que tu possèdes, les savoir-faire pour créer le, le, le motif, mais aussi les habiletés que tu peux développer pour faire ces, ces broderies euh, de perles, ces broderies de fils de soie. Et cette exposition, elle est uniquement au sol, Lorsqu'elle arrive au... Euh, je crois qu'il n'y a plus rien. OK. Bon, parfait. Merci. Cette exposition, hein, ce, ce chemin, euh, est installée dans, dans de grandes salles et vous marchez à, la, à, à côté de ces empeignes. Il y en a des centaines et des centaines. Et vous marchez le long de ce chemin, justement, d'une production artisanale, artistique, par des femmes. Ce sont les femmes qui font ces empeignes de mocassins. Et c'est quelque chose d'extrêmement fort. C'est quelque chose qui vous entraîne, que vous soyez anthropologue ou pas, qui vous entraîne ailleurs, mais qui, pour moi, est extrêmement proche de ce que peut être une manifestation, une expression de savoir autochtone dans la modernité. Ça, c'est une image 
Et l'autre image, c'est celle qui est amenée par la fabrication des régalia. Hein, je ne sais pas si vous connaissez, je ne sais pas le régalia en anglais aussi, le terme. Ces costumes que les, euh, que les personnes, hommes, femmes, enfants, euh, confectionnent dans le contexte des pawa. C'est extrêmement répandu euh, au Québec et c'est répandu au Canada. Et il y a dans ces formes d'expression quelque chose qui est à découvrir. Et je crois qu'une des pistes pour les anthropologues à partir d'aujourd'hui, c'est de donner place à plusieurs formes de manifestations artistiques. Pas simplement la parole. La parole, c'est bien sûr extrêmement important. Pour nous, c'est l'écrit d'une certaine manière, bien que ce que nous faisons ici aujourd'hui, c'est une manifestation d'oralité. Hein? Alors, tout à l'heure, on parlait des oppositions. Quand on oppose oralité et écriture, on ne dit pas vraiment tout ce qui se passe parce que nous sommes ici dans une situation d'oralité. Mais il faut aller plus loin que l'écriture versus l'oralité. Il faut intégrer maintenant ces performances, ces modes d'expression, euh, ces paroles silencieuses, je dirais. Et je crois que le défi de l'anthropologie, c'est d'intégrer dans ces corpus d'informations ces manifestations qui sont difficilement, euh, on peut les décrire, on peut les situer à tel endroit, mais il faut réussir à les comprendre si on veut aller plus loin dans l'expression, dans la je dirais, la compréhension de ces relations nouvelles. Il faut faire plus qu'accueillir. Faire plus qu'accueillir ces formes, il faut aussi aller voir les significations. Derrière chaque empeigne de mocassins, il y a toute une vie, il y a des savoirs, il y a des savoir-faire, il y a des connaissances, il y a des relations. Hein? Les systèmes de connaissances autochtones sont d'abord et avant tout des systèmes relationnels. Dans les régalia, ces costumes, des pawa, il y a tout un art de vivre, il y a toute une expression de son appartenance au groupe et à l'univers. Il y a ces formes qu'on néglige ou qu'on étudie uniquement sous l'angle descriptif. Alors, dans la construction et la compréhension de ces relations contemporaines et modernes, je crois que l'anthropologie euh, a intérêt à se pencher sur les significations euh, modernes de savoir, de savoir-faire, de... et ce n'est pas toujours par la parole que l'on peut y accéder. I, I agree completely with what Carol had, had to say on that point. Um, and in, I could go further in that direction, but I just want to add a, a, something in another direction again, coming from my, myself. So as you've heard, I've been particularly taken by the sophistication and the, of the history of indigenous political thought and its and the way in which the and it's manifesting itself through these relational um, uh, projects that we're talking about and so from my my point of view and and it started way back and i could talk about that uh, situation where i was told a story and then i've been given 40 years to try to understand the story, um, which is a way of conveying indigenous knowledge. And I've got to tell you, it's one of the most amazing experiences that I've encountered. I mean, if I'd been given two stories, I don't know what I'd do. Um, because this one story is so, has so much in it, and it, it goes through. It, it explains mouse better than mouse. It, 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 you know, it's like it, it, go, it, it really is a wonderful story. Um, but what I'm trying to do now is say, as an anthropologist, I now am beginning to appreciate, I'm not trying to work too soon, it's 40 years, I'm beginning to appreciate that 
maybe there's something I can say about this. So where do I go in our own literature? Have there been any anthropologists who have thought about these things along the way in a healthy way, in a way that would be enriching to me? And that's where I'm going. Where is there in Western thought that we can find little traces of this? Because it's not as well developed, that's for damn sure. But it's not absent and it offers a place for a conversation that we don't have to invent. It offers a place. So that's, that's really where I'm focusing right now in terms of trying to do something with the aspect of the indigenous knowledge that I've been fortunate enough to learn something about, a little bit something. And I'm not being falsely modest. I really mean a very little something about. Miigwech. Was that a question? Or? Okay. Um, I, we're coming to the close. I would like to say, uh, I give a, uh, in Anishinaabe Moan, we say miigwech, but uh, chi miigwech, which means thank you very much, basically, is a rough translation. Uh, to our esteemed colleagues and, and panelists here, if I could each give them a lifelong learning feather to go with it, I would, because they are pioneers, they are mentors, they have given us a great honor to be here, coming from far, wide, and working exclusively and, and passionately with communities. Um, and for that, that is a, a commitment of a lifetime that you have all led, and thank you for that. I'm greatly honored to be here as your, as your uh, moderator, and again, I want to thank uh, all of you for coming out. And one final thought is, is that I think capitalizing on what you're saying, and using that word capitalization, maybe I shouldn't, but in, in listening to what you're saying is that the conversations continue and that the conversations in anthropology continue. That's the one thing that I was always drawn to anthropology was that they always questioned where we're, our knowledge was from, who we are, who are the communities that we're working with, who, what is it that allows us to, to go out and work with a community and yet also honor that community and honor that knowledge base and that people that they come from. So I'll channel William Commander's voice in saying that we all have a valid voice. We all have things to say, but we just all must listen because we are given two ears and one mouth. And so with that, I will leave you. I will thank you very much. And again, thank you, Scott Simon, for putting this panel together. And uh, have a good farewell to the rest of your thing. Please return your headphones. Thank you.